Now in the third part of this discourse, and the final part, I want to discuss a cause celeb, something in the news over the, within the last decade. I think it was about four or five years ago, but I haven't researched it. It's in my memory that as I saw it on television, it's one of those things I, I noted probably in my diary. I haven't been able to search back and find it. It was a news item. I believe it was national news, although it occurred locally, uh, that is in Los Angeles County, where a Roman Catholic bishop came out openly against pornographic movies, which I thought was a manful and noble thing for him to do. He might have done it because of the leading of the papacy, or might have done it on his own, but he came out and attacked pornographic movies and simply said, we need to uh, do something about this, uh, we need to have less of this, and we ought to have good movies rather than bad movies. Now, understanding the Catholic philosophy, uh, as I do, and I think I do, I believe the way that he made that statement uh, had some implications concerning his audience. He, that is, it was, a, it was a mass audience, a news audience. The Catholics, the word Catholic means universal. It's been in use since uh, Theodosius the Great, uh, around thir uh, 380, and it was in use in the days of uh, St. Augustine. And it betrays a certain attitude that you can see in 20th century Roman Catholic writers such as G.K. Chesterton. It would be that um, essentially Western civilization is Christian because the Christian church has been implanted in the mainstream of our culture. And so you'll find Chesterton using the word world in a favorable sense and he'll talk about how the goal of the devil is to destroy the world. And by the world he means Western civilization and by Western civilization he means the Catholic tradition and by the Catholic tradition he means the church. So they're all synonymous. So if that's the case with this bishop, he was giving out a kind of kind and gentle suggestion to his hearers that we ought to get rid of pornographic movies on the basis that he's addressing Western civilization saying, now, brethren, let's get together again and revert to what my father would have called common decency. And let's understand that this, uh, this pornographic business, pornography and pornea, uh, all of this uh, hostility or indifference to the Christian ethic of fleeing fornication is a momentary moment of bad behavior in Western civilization and that the pendulum back. So it's kind of the pendulum swing view. You know that that's true of G.K. Chesterton, that basically he thinks that there are very evil things that happen, and then always the church swings back. In other words, the, the religious position there uh, taken is not apocalyptic. Uh, apocalypse, as a matter of fact, has a negative connotation, as I understand it in the Catholic tradition. It certainly does in the evangelicalism of Charles Colson, where he affirms separation of church and state and treats the word apocalypse as a negative word all the way through. So Colson is a total antagonist. But anyway, this man was trying to rally Western civilization, this bishop, around the premise that common decency is still there, Christianity is still here, churches are still here, and this is a pendulum swing. Hopefully we can swing back in the direction of moral decency and get rid of pornography, the pornography industry. Well, as a follow-up news item, a couple of days later, there was the inevitable demonstration by a group of young people who wanted pornography rights or pornea rights. That is, they lived a pornographic culture and they want to defend their, their right. And they defended it in the name of American institutions. Uh, and the important thing is it wasn't just freedom of speech. You'd expect that. But they were carrying a big poster, at least one, I think maybe more than one, marked separation of church and state. So they were linking the separation of church and state ideal and the very secularism I'm talking about to the cause of pornography. Now, there are two ways of responding. If you're like me and you hate pornography and like that bishop and hates it because of what it means, it means a, a failure to obey the scriptures and fleeing, uh, fleeing fornication. What it, two ways to react to that or respond to that. The patriot, the person who hasn't worked out this business of the secularism of, of separation of church and state, would say, throw their hands up in horror and sort of pronounce a Jeremiah and say, look at how deviant these young people are, these kids out here, carrying around a, a, a poster with the great principle of separation of church and state and using that to defend their pornography and their immorality, wrapping pornea in the American flag, and what they would say, what a deviant behavior, and what a, what a wicked thing to do. That's not how I took it. I took it in an apocalyptic way. The fact is that wrapping pornea in the American flag is very appropriate because that's what it always meant. <laughs> Thomas, maybe Thomas Jefferson didn't mean that by pursuit of happiness, but if you understand the radical secularism of this entire 18th century system, it's inevitable that sooner or later, immoral people, godless people, would find a way to achieve an immoral and godless consensus and build that out of the foundation laid by Jefferson. So as far as I'm concerned, this was just a revelation of what separation church and state means. In other words, I concede separation church and state to those people. They're right. That's their baby. That's their law. That's their principle. 
and their uh, use of that to defend pornography is very typical of what this system ultimately comes to mean because the concept of common decency just isn't valid. It just doesn't work. You can talk about how citizens are going to be a certain way. Well, they're not that way after a while. After a while, they decide that abortion is right and so forth. And so the 18th century parliamentarian assumptions underlying Jefferson are not true. He would assume there's a common decency to keep men together without having to get all religious. But the, the fact is it doesn't work because human nature is of that character. Well, now that brings me into the basic issue then over this pornography issue. If you're like me and if you're like the bishop, what options are available to us to sanction, to do something about pornography, to suppress it, to rule it back, to get rid of it, to do something about it? That is, if you have that will he had and the will I have and the will other Christians have to flee fornication, you don't want to see people corrupted that way, what uh, do you do? What kinds of options? Now, hey, I want to go through the options. And then when I do, I come to the final option, I'll be describing how the apocalypse works. But let's first of all consider, what do you do about pornography if you're against it? Yes, we're describing the ultimate solution to the problem of abortion, the problem of pornography, the por a problem of evils in mainstream civilization that can't be stopped as long as we're under the regime of separation of church and state. And they're to be stopped through a revolution, a worldwide revolution, that means the end of the regime of separation of church and state. And that means the revival of theocracy. And the revival of theocracy is to come in an apocalyptic form. One of the goals of apocalypse is to reestablish theocracy and to do an end, to put to an end, the thing that came into existence in the 18th century. And here is the promise, one of the least known in all of scripture, because it does not fit into the American scheme of things that promises the solution to things like the pornography problem. And he who overcomes, and he who keeps my deeds until the end, and that's in the original Greek, akritelos, he who keeps my deeds until the end, that's that same phrase that you have in Hebrews 6, and it has a technical meaning. And remember in that verse it says, full assurance of hope until the end. The end being a point beyond which hope no longer needs to operate because you have something else except hope, and that something else is called glory, and it implies power, listen to the promise. To him I will give authority over the nations. Now to start with that, that's imperialism, folks. And that is what Jefferson and the other American revolutionaries fought against. That's what Washington fought against. The overthrow is Christian imperialism to bring in a secular state. So it's the nation state versus imperialism. The fascinating thing is that this man on the East Coast, I think Lyndon LaRoche, is trying to appeal to a popular following on the basis that the great hope of the modern world is the nation state. That's the same idea as Washington and Jefferson and others. But I'm saying that the great hope of a world order in which you don't have and you don't have abortion, you don't have evils of that sort, is not the nation state. It is exactly what we have here. To him I will give power within the nation no. To him I will give power over the nations. That's a promise. Power over the nations. And what kind of power? Power to preach the gospel to them? <laughs> power to go out there and persuade them? Power to bring about a ha better, happier life through a kinder, gentler approach? No. <laughs> Not at all. Verse 27 of Revelation 2. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces as I also have received authority from my Father. This is a quotation from the Messianic Psalm 2, in which a promise, which the statement is, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh because the nations have imagined a vain thing. In other words, they are rebelling against God. And the, the passage promises that the Messiah of Israel will smash, destroy the nations, and conquer them, and overrule them, and overpower them. And that promise given to the Messiah, and therefore transferable to Jesus Christ, who is the Messiah, is here transferred to the Christian church, is transferred to believers, is transferred to Christians. And so the solution to the problem of pornography is for me to go out on a Saturday in the resurrection state, having reached the end, and being in a resurrection body, and then going out and confiscating and destroying the property of the pornographers. At that point, the police intervene. They try to do what they did before. They're out there to protect property. And the fact of the matter is that in this case, the police power 
has been automatically abrogated. How is that? Are we lawless, lawless ones? No. This isn't lawlessness. Listen carefully, folks. This, again, is neglected logic. Police power, power of the government, uh, power of the military, all of which is an extension of the principle of Romans 13, is grounded in the sword. That is, I am under the police, and I'm subject to the police, and I can't go out and destroy the pornographer's stock and property. I'm not free to do that, because they exercise a sanction based on a sword. Now, what's a sword <clears throat> in Scripture, Romans 13? A sword is an instrument of lethal violence, of capital punishment. Now, what are we dealing with in this passage, this ruling the nations and smashing them with a rod of iron? What are we looking at? Jesus Christ defines Christian immortality, or immortals, in Luke 20. And it says that these are people who are sons of God, meaning that they have a godlike nature, even beyond what Christians have today. They are godlike people being sons of the resurrection. He says they do not marry, but then the correct statement is they can not die. Now, if you have people who cannot die, the weapon of lethal violence is irrelevant to them. And therefore, the entire sanction of government, as it operates in Roman requires us to be subject only as long as our mortality lasts. Once we become immortal, there's an automatic revolution, and we hold the sword, and we rule over nations. And the result is a theocratic reign of terror. And that's what we're looking at now. Reign of terror, Christians, transformed Christians, inheriting a promise to smash nations. This again has been explained away. You know how it's explained away? Once again, the church is living in a state of compromise with, these, with the uh, separation of church and state system. And if you bring up this argument that the apocalypse might transform me into an agent to go out and to destroy the stock of the pornographers tomorrow, uh, and that the police can't stop me because I can't die. You know what Christian tradition does with that to maintain the compromise? They have decided, Christian tradition, uh, evangelicals, even fundamentalists, have decided that the instant I take on immortality, I'm able to go out and destroy the property of the pornographers. I will disappear. It's called the disappearance rapture, and it's another one of these fundamental errors. It's a structural error introduced in order to make peace with the secular regime. Uh, just as you make peace with them by talking about the afterlife and never talking about apocalyptic things, you also make peace with them by saying that the instant believers acquire the nature necessary to enforce their anti-pornography uh, position and do so by force and effectively, as in this promise, they tell you that you disappear. Now that's a fallacy based on a misreading of 1 Thessalonians 4 that says the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we know from 1 Corinthians 15 that there will be a transformation of living believers. And then it goes on to say that there will be a rapture. And they simply assume. It says, next there will be a rapture. In the original Greek, epeta, there will be a rapture. The word epeta is used sometimes to cover a 2,000-year period. But they've assumed that it covers no time at all. And that you go from the Christian resurrection into the And that way, they compromise because they're making the rapture look like death in Christ. And it's all very harmless again. But <laughs> I'm telling you. Apocalyptic Christianity is not harmless. Apocalyptic Christianity involves the sanction of ruling the nations with a rod of iron. And the means to that end is the promised Christian resurrection and the promised Christian transformation of living saints into immortality. And there is absolutely no reason that we should not inherit that promise and, and, and be enabled to act on the stock of the pornographers and put them out of business by force, not by persuasion. This is not persuasion. Look at this again. This is not persuasion. This is not friendly persuasion. This is not converting anybody. This is a matter of taking people's pornography away by force because you're functioning in a superhuman condition. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Now, that's not, a, that's not moral persuasion. That's, a, that's a, 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 a reign of terror on the part of a theocracy. So this is the final solution to the pornography problem. But it only, you only take it seriously if you distance yourself from this compromised, our children are our future, earthy, materialistic uh, system known as separation church and state. Once you get that out of your heart, once you get that out of your mind, you understand that God has a plan, yes, for a certain amount of moral persuasion through the gospel now, but that doesn't solve the problem of pornography, and it doesn't solve the problem of abortion. So what do you do about pornography and abortion? I'm telling you why God is permitting abortion and pornography. It's very simple. He's permitting it. He's permitting it so that people will read this. You see that? You see the connection? And I'll conclude on this. I'll simply conclude again. 
that God's motive in permitting heinous evils like this to well up from, from within the democratic secular state in the modern world is to get Christians to realize that political action under the present regime cannot do it, that moral suasion through the gospel cannot do it, it's not intended to, and that what's intended to end to pornography is the Christian glorification, resurrection, the end named in Hebrews 6.11, the end named in Revelation 26. And again, I'll read it. And he who overcomes, and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. In other words, where God has a plan to bring about an apocalypse that takes the form of a concrete body of superhuman beings, very much like our conception science fiction of space invaders. And they have the power and the privilege to take the pornographers by the throat and put them out of business against their will, and neither the police, nor the military, nor the government, nor the United Nations can do a thing to stop them, can do a thing to stop us.